Folks, the Women's March uh, led the largest mass resistance march in history, uh, January 2017. Folks all across the country and the world uh, gather. The reality is this here, the, the four individuals uh, who really uh, made that possible, leading that particular effort, uh, putting together the strategy and everything behind it, Tamika Mallory, Linda Sarsour, Carmen Perez, Bob Bland. There were others involved as well, but they were uh, four co-chairs. Well, guess what? Uh, history also shows that when you are one of those uh, leading forces, other forces want to take you out. They saw that with that sort of mass gathering around Trump's inauguration, what then would happen if those four were leading over the next four years? Well, guess what? I told you how white supremacy works. And we're talking about white supremacy, we're not talking just about here in the United States. When I'm talking about white fear, uh, which is my book, we also are talking about Russia and Putin and how they also think and operate. And so they then began to activate Russian troll farms who then began to viciously go after uh, the leaders, especially Linda Sarsour. Folks, the New York Times uh, this week published a story that laid out, this was the headline, how Russian trolls helped keep the Women's March out of lockstep. Joining us now is uh, Tamika Mallory and Linda Sarsour. Glad to have both of you back on the show. Um, Linda, I'm going to start with you because uh, you were quoted in an article as saying, here y'all had this massive moment, and all, but and it was like it was a high. People were talking about it, and all of a sudden, there is this deluge of folks just coming after and just with all kind of stuff, and it was hitting from all quarters at the same time. The hate we received, um, Roland, immediately after the Women's March was not organic nor authentic. And we knew that, but there was no way to prove it. Um, the ways in which we were being criticized from every left, right, from the north to the south, we didn't know what to believe. We didn't know what was going on. But what we knew was that online hate and harassment that I received um, in the beginning of the march that then, of course, as you know, leaked into our other co-chairs and the Women's March was actually dangerous and it set a dangerous precedent. And just to be clear, the sentiments that the Russian government amplified already existed on the internet from the alt-right, from the right wing, from right wing Zionists, it was already there. So it wasn't that the Russians created the content, they just amplified the content that they had already seen in the dark corners of the web. Which then, as you know, when you keep repeating a lie, you keep repeating a lie, you keep re repeating a lie, mainstream media was hoodwinked. A white women who were part of the Women's March and, and supporters of ours across the country were also hoodwinked. Some progressives or people who consider themselves to be progressives were hoodwinked. And I will say this about Russia, knowing that we do have folks in this country, including the Republican Party and, and white supremacists, there's an ideological uh, connection to the Russian government. The Russian government wanted Trump to be the president of the United States of America, knowing how he would interact with them on foreign policy. But once he got in, they needed to protect Donald Trump. And so they decided that the Women's March and me in particular were going to be the target to try to undermine what they believed to be a strong, united, anti-Trump force in America. And the, the, the thing there that Linda just talked about there, Tamika, uh, really jumps out. How, when, the le right and then the left begins to amplify the exact same thing. So now all of a sudden you have no protection. You're like in an island all by yourself uh, and people are throwing stuff out and then you're like trying to respond and now you, 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 you're getting hit by your known critics, but now you're getting hit by allies and you're sitting here the whole time going, this is bullshit, what are you doing? But they are feeding into it and then it becomes a feeding frenzy. Absolutely. I mean, the Internet is very dangerous. As you know, Roland, we talk about it all the time. Um, once these, ent these entities, and I think Linda mentioned something that is so important, the sentiment was already there from people who would be our opposition. And in my case, particularly when dealing with other Black folks online who were trolling and, you know, feeding negativity about me on the Internet, 
what happens is that these people who are, are able to exploit that sentiment, they pick it up, they take those, you know, different issues and they exploit it. And I'll give you an example of one issue, which actually was not a troll problem. It was a real issue that the name of the Women's March was really um, sort of co-opting the 1999 march that happened called the Million Women's March. So that's how the white women came into the space already co-opting a previous movement and a previous name. And Black women were very upset about that. The New York Times article shows you how the Russians, they found out that that was an issue and they exploited it, exploited it by having a hashtag called change the name. And under it, they were uh, positioning themselves, imposters as black women, as LGBTQIA women and men um, and other individuals who were spewing much hate against us as the leaders and also the Women's March movement in general. And so I think it's really important as we figure out, like, what do we do going forward that we all understand anything you put in the universe, even if it's just a, a general critique, it can be exploited. So yep. we have to put ourselves on whether or not whatever we're saying is necessary and how it can harm a movement. Uh, it's interesting because uh, just the other day um, they were um, on Charlemagne's show on Comedy Central, they were talking about DeSantis, and he called the move by DeSantis genius. Uh, he, and he said, well, Democrats don't want the people in, in, in their states either. The moment that went public, the right latches on to it, Charlemagne the God calls DeSantis move genius. And right. so it's understanding how information works. Uh, I, I remember when uh, I remember when um, when y'all terms were up. And for folks who did not know, y'all were term limited as co-chairs, correct? Well, we, were, no, we were term limited as board members. Right. And we could have, first of all, we were founders of the organization. Right. So we could have stayed forever if we were able, of, of course, if the other board members would have continued to vote for us to stay. But at the end of our term, we decided it was time for us to go. And I have to say this, and I hope Linda will, you know, she, I'm sure she'll jump in. The New York Times, I appreciate. I appreciate that they did this research and put this in the universe and, you know, published this story. But they also were perpetrators of those who attacked the Women's March and allowed people right. to to to, to uh, be presented with platforms to tell lies about us. Um, and so there were a lot of, of, of folks around who are now calling us to say either they're apologetic or they didn't really know. And we were trying to tell them all along that you all are being duped. You all have said they were being duped. I'm a little, you know, I ain't in the dupe space. I'm in the, it was very <laughs> and coordinated. That's how I feel. But, but, he, but here's where, where I was going with that. Uh, because I knew your terms were up. I knew, and so I'll never forget, the Washington Post did a story basically yep. saying y'all were run out. Right, that's right. And what then happened was, and I'll never forget, news1.com and Blavity picked up their story, rewrote it, and followed it. I saw it, and, I, and so, and I've been critical of Black Enterprise, The Root, I've always been critical when Black media does this. So what right. they did, they then aggregated, rewrote it, basically put a black put put their name on it. And I said, what are y'all doing? I said, you're just rewriting a Washington Post story. I said, how can you be black media and you don't have Tamika's phone number? You pick the goddamn <laughs> phone up and call and say, hey, what's going on here? I hit Morgan DeBond at Blavity. I hit Bruce at News One, said, take this bullshit down. That's simply not true. If y'all just call somebody, and they're like, oh my God, so they took it down, but, it was a per but it's a perfect example of when they, they, they will take a story that's in mainstream media, and again, put it in black media, and then black folks go, oh, well, I saw it in Blavity, I saw it in News One Now, I saw it on The Root, I saw it on Black Enterprise, so it gotta be true, and I'm like, no, 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 no. That's the one thing we cannot do is amplify their stuff because now you're giving a stamp of approval. And Linda, that happened repeatedly where stuff will get written and you're sitting here going, this is a flat out lie. Flat out lie. 
That's why, Roland, we love coming on your show, and we have been um, longtime supporters of your journalistic ethics. This this entire New York Times story is an expose not just on the Russian government. It's an expose on the media. The bottom line here is that as a journalist, your job is not to write what the Internet is saying. Your job is to write what you investigate and what you have facts to back up. And that was the issue that we had. We had media outlets regurgitating what they saw on the Internet. To your point about when we left the Women's March on Washington, all you had to do was look at our bylaws. You could look at our bylaws. You could see the timeline of when we were instated as board members. We had two-year terms. You could look at the timeline of when people started calling for our resignation, which was over a year before we actually left the Women's March. We did not leave the Women's March heeding to the calls of resignation. We committed to a two-year term at the board at the Women's March. We completed our two years, and then we went out in the world to do the good work that we always do. And you made this point earlier, uh, Roland, and I want to say this to all the viewers. The Women's March did not make Tamika Mallory, and it not, did not make me, it did not make Carmen Perez, and it did not make the women who were part of the Women's March at that time. We made the Women's March, and now we are not at the Women's March. And guess what, like you said, the kind of organizing that we were capable of, the high visibility that we were capable of, the strategy that we had, the partnerships, I mean, the largest civil disobediences that this country had ever seen, that was us rolling it. Now we are not there, and that is why you do not see the same type of organizing, because it was us that made the Women's March. And this is a cautionary tale for the movement. Who has interest in undermining some of the best and most effective organizers in America? That's the, that's the question you have to ask. And for me personally, I say this, and I'll say this to you, and I tell this to Tamika, and say this across the movement. Unity is not uniformity. So we don't all have to agree on everything. There are going to be issues, Roland, that you know people don't agree with me on my foreign policy issue. They don't agree with me on Israel-Palestine. They don't agree with us on defund police. There's many issues that we could debate. But that does not mean because we do not agree on certain issues, that means that we fracture an entire movement, that we marginalize leaders that we know we need in this very critical moment, as Tamika wrote a book called State of Emergency. And we right now are in a state of emergency. And so I feel vindicated. Tamika's vindicated. We knew this wasn't authentic. We didn't. We knew that millions of people didn't know who we were to hate us. But guess what? The Russians, with the right wing, they succeeded in undermining a very powerful movement that we helped build. And the thing here, Tamika, is look. We can again look at history. We can look at what COINTELPRO did. We, we can look at uh, what they tried to do in trying to destroy uh, uh, the Black Freedom Movement. The reality is, they saw. Wait a minute. If this is how Trump's four years is starting, oh, hell no. We can't let these folks build no. up momentum. And, mm -hmm. the, and, and, the, and the difference and the difference between previous movements, the difference between Dr. King and others is that the other folks who were allies did, knew what was happening and didn't fall for the okie doke. The mm -hmm. problem is, when it came to the Women's March, the folk who were supposedly on your side, they fell for the okie doke and didn't even realize that by them participating in it, they basically blew it up themselves. And, the, and, and facts are facts. Since y'all left, we ain't heard jack from the Women's March. All of that organiza organization, the database, everything, it's like, huh? That was like, a, it was a moment. And that was the whole point. Only make it a moment, not make it allow it to become a movement. Well, mm. it's the same, you know, same thing now with what we see happening with uh, Black Lives Matter and all of the reporting about resources and money and who spent which money where. Now, let me be clear. Accountability is important. And we don't always make the right decisions. There are things that I'm sure each, all of us sitting here, people listening, we would have done it different. And, you know, and I've said that to leaders within the Black Lives Matter movement, but I am constantly challenging, as you said, Roland, I'm not talking about right wing folks. I'm not talking about, uh, you, you know, Republican who are who Republicans or even Democrats that are angry with the administration. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about people who are in our movement, people who are walking right next to us that are sharing stories from the New York Post, Daily Mail and all of these right wing. Uh, what do y'all call them? Rag news outlets. <laughs> 
no good, never have been for our communities. They lie, they are racist, and we share the articles and the story from their perspective about our organization. Right. Once do you see these people reporting that while there may have been purchases that you can question, that's up to you if you feel they shouldn't have spent money here or there in the third. They never mentioned that over $30 million of the resources that, that Black Lives Matter raised during the summer of 2020 went to organizations and families who are victims of some type of violence. They don't even really tell you about that. They're, they want you to know about the things that they are clear will incite right. um, and, 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 and have people feeling resentful of the movement and then have our folks online talking about how we don't support Black-led organizations because they're stealing money. Uh, it's very intentional, and they've been doing it. Every single Black leader that we know and Black organizations that have been out there yep. really midst of a movement that is transforming culture has been accused of taking money or some type of financial impropriety. If we don't wake up and recognize that these people are using us against us, you know, it's, I, I, I love the conversations. Um, and as Linda said, it, it really does feel like vindication to hear us talking about these you know, folks who are our opposition that leaned in and how the Russians, you all, I love that. But I love to I I personally want to focus on how our own people right. capture the message. We spread it and we become the perpetuators yep. of type of uh, disinformation in our communities, and it only undermines us. Well, I, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, I remember when, and I'm gonna go to my panelists for questions as well. Uh, I remember when the Newsweek article hit about HBCU funding, and I remember. Uh, and, and, and I saw it, and I remember Jamal, Jamal posted something, you posted something, and I saw it. First thing I did, yo, that's bullshit. That's, right. mm -hmm. Take it down. And, be, and again, for me, the role that I serve, I, I, I love when people go, Roland, why aren't you leading marches? Because that ain't my job. Somebody <laughs> got to report on the march. So my role is the... Inf inf I'm the news person. And so when I see something and it's not right, the first thing I think is, oh, if you or Linda or Jamal or someone else puts it out, they go, oh, well, they did. Right. So, that, so, so to me, that's our personal checks and balances when certain things happen with kind of like, hey, I don't think you want to do that. Uh, because, because, and, 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 by, and by talking, it's like, oh, damn. I didn't think about that. Thanks for calling. But see, that's, that's, that's the role that we have, but that's also when it comes to trust. That's why I keep telling people, to your point, you got to stop. When, when, when you share someone's article, you literally are sharing their perspective and how they reported the article. And it's not, well, who they didn't call and how they shading it. What's the headline? What's the focus of the story? Don't give me that objective. No, no, no. There's no such thing as objective. Everybody is subjective because it's still written from their point of view. Go ahead. I was just gonna say we all we all fall victim to it. Like yes. it's not, you know, it's, it's 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 something that we have to be conscious of. And to your point, for me, I have checks and balances. Sometimes I still fail at you yeah, know. We all do. Yeah, we, but but knowing first of all. Who is writing the story? Yeah. Where is this perspective coming from? That's probably the first place that you have to start. And it's the reason why I bring the New York Times article up in terms of when they ran stories or at least one big story that was full of lies about Linda. Um, well, not Linda so much in that story. It was really Carmen Perez and me. That's where we were targeted by the Times. So now you have an entity that people actually... They believe, they trust the New York Times. And even they did not do due diligence. They did, in fact, speak to me. The, the writer spoke to me for, I don't know, must have been about an hour. We were in a hotel room on tour with the Women's March somewhere. And they spoke to me for about an hour. And when the story came out, there was literally one line of what I said and full of lies from this person who was making accusations that she also knows uh, was full of lies. And so, you know, I think people have to be more careful with where they're getting information. And to your point, call 
folks yourself and ask them, is this true? Give me your perspective. And if you're going to write a story, at least put the voice of those who are being accused in it. Um, before I go to Nola, Reese, and Greg, uh, I saw this. Was, I guess we were at the um, Rock Nation uh, conference, and Carmen Perez said, people have no idea the four years of hell that we all went through. Funds dried up. Um, we, stuff was stripped. We lost a lot. Uh, just for folks who don't understand, because th th there's a flip side of this. Y'all didn't just uh, leave the Women's March organization. Again, y'all caught hell for four years. Yeah, thank you, New York Times, for now reporting it, but that doesn't erase the crap that y'all had to deal with personally for four years. Linda first, then Tamika. I appreciate you, um, Roland, bringing up that part. It's hard for us to speak about that. You're, you know, we're warriors in the movement. We're on the front lines. We stand up against police and powerful forces. So it's hard to talk about what the impact was of the disinformation campaigns against us. It compromised our safety, the safety of our families. Um, you know, if it wasn't for my own Muslim community across the country who held me up, I probably wouldn't have been able to pay my rent. I mean, it was absolutely outrageous um, for a short period of time. And let me just tell you, God is good. And, and God uh, gave us a purpose and put us back on the field, as you know, put us back on the front lines. And we're very proud of where we are today. But we had the death threats. I had FBI agents come to my home in New York to tell me that I was an, on an assassination list. I had people mailing my mother photos of my children. My mom still has a landline in Brooklyn, New York, and my mom and, and dad, both who are senior citizens, had to hear some of the most horrific things that you could ever imagine, threats against their daughter, their oldest daughter, the daughter that they love. So for us, it wasn't just about a bunch of people saying some lies about us online or about people trolling us online. It was about being able to put our own resources to higher security just so we can continue to do the activism that we care about. So I want people to know that this New York Times article is vindication, but it does not take or bring us back or give us back what we lost. And the most important thing that we lost, at least in my opinion, is number one, our humanity, our decades and track record of the work that we were doing on such a consistent basis, and most importantly, our safety that was compromised and continues to be compromised until today. Uh, I'm, um, I was looking for, I'm trying to look for something here, uh, uh, Tamika. I remember, um, I remember somebody wanted you to speak, and um, and they called me and they said, "Well, we got to bring this other person as well." And I said, "That's security." <laughs> and I, I said, "No, no, it's not with a security firm." I said, "But you need to understand what's going on here." Mm -hmm. And I was, and I remember I was, I was trying to go through here. The, I was trying to think. It was at least it was probably 20, 20, It was probably twenty nineteen. Yeah. And I said, you need to understand mm -hmm. what's happening here. Mm -hmm. This ain't just you're bringing in a regular speaker. There are literal, there are folks who want to do harm, including folk who look like us. Uh, and that's the piece that folk don't want to confront is what you had to, what y'all had to deal with that, what this campaign did. And then when it turned your own people against you, y'all were in a situation, who in the hell do I trust? Mm. It was, it was 2019 is a year that I, I don't like to talk about. It was a year that I went through such a deep, dark depression that, um, you know, before the year ended, as Linda said, I was financially in so much trouble that I had to text my friends to ask them if they would send money to help me because I had either, I was either going to buy groceries or pay my car note. That's how bad the situation was. And this is after leading one of the most important, impactful um, uh, marches and resistance movements um, that this country has ever seen. And one of the leaders, or all of the leaders, in one way or another, had no money to pay their bills because of what we were experiencing with people closing doors, canceling every single speaking engagement. And Linda and I always talk about, you know, at one point she was under attack in a way that was, it was extremely dangerous. It was more violent. Um, you know, her family was being threatened. There was so much happening. 
happening. And we sat and we watched it and we were, we had to hire security. She was paying for personal security. There was so much happening. And I, I had not been hit in that way at that point. And then they came for me, right? Mm-hmm. So what's the, you know, the, 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 the state, the saying that they'll co- go for everyone else. And then eventually they come for you. And so they came for me. And when they did, All of us sat back. I remember distinctly having a conversation one day where Linda and other women were acknowledging that the way in which black women are abused is like nothing they have ever seen before. You know, she was like, oh, you're not trending on Twitter, so it's going to be okay. We can, you know, don't worry, because I was, you know, crying, emotional, everything you could think of. And she was like, no, I'm telling you, it's going to be okay. We're working it out. And I remember her calling me one day saying, sis, it's, it, this is not good. Things are really, really, really bad. And so, you know, it caused a lot of issues between us, too. We don't talk about it often because we're way past it. And, you know, and, and I love Linda like she's my blood sister. And the same with Carmen and Bob, because Bob could have left us. She could have retreated to her people and said, I'm going with the white women and I'm going to cut ties with you all and denounce you. But she didn't. She stood with us because she understood that we were not the people that was being talked about and the way we were being portrayed in the media. And she knew something was wrong with what was happening. And she went with her gut and she stood with us. And because of that, Bob is a sister to us. And so but it, it did cause rifts. And, and real difficult moments between us because we were being hit like wildfire. And, you know, I just, I'm, I'm glad we made it through, but I can tell you, Roland, and you know it because you've been up at two o'clock in the morning with me on the phone trying to counsel me through these moments. I mean, I sat in rehab um, trying to get myself uh, unaddicted to uh, prescription pills because during this time it was so dark. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to make it. I was 98 pounds. And so you're talking about real serious trauma that these people and this 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 force that it caused us. And, you know, I don't know if we're ever going to get over it. Um, what people, as I listen to the both of you, you talked about losing speaking engagements and the physical and the depression. Literally, my mind went right back to April 5th, 1967 to April 4th, 1968. The last year of Dr. King's life was absolute hell. But his approval rating among black people fell below 30 percent. He was hated and despised and had bouts of depression. Yes, speaking engagement, you know, dried up. All these different things happened. uh, And and it was a tumultuous uh, final year. What people and, and, and the reason I, reason I wanted to give enough space for this conversation, and yes, I am coming to Greg Reese and Nola, trust me. The reason <laughs> I wanted to give the space because I need the people watching. And I really need the people watching to understand this. Y'all sit at home, and I'm not dissing people who are watching, but I need you to understand when you're not on the front lines of a battle, you're seeing the end results of planning. You're seeing the march, you're seeing the rally, you're seeing that. You ain't seeing everything else. You're not seeing what people are dealing with, the the vicious level of attacks. And the internet has totally changed the game now because so much of our data is now public. People now can get access to your cell phone. And all of a sudden, you're getting weird text messages and phone calls and you can change it and they can get it immediately. And so uh, it, it, it requires a whole lot to deal with all of this. And as I said, when people who you thought were al- allies then begin to come after you and begin to attack you and then to attack your name and again attack your credibility, uh, then all of a sudden, and then you, then you start showing up places and it's why in the hell are y'all here? Oh, y'all failed the other group. Now you're trying to something else. When y'all started Until Freedom. I mean, I remember hearing the things uh, that, 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 that people were saying. Uh, and, the, the, and, and I remember the conversation we had, the Million Man March 20th anniversary, uh, when I said, I'm going to use all my platforms to amplify y'all because y'all are actually putting in the work. A lot of people out here, oh, I would love to do what Tamika and Linda and Carmen and Bob are doing. Or people come up to me, man, I would love to do what you do. And I would then say, but do you want to go through what I went through? Mm-hmm. 
That's the one thing that people don't necessarily want to deal with when they got to address that. Uh, let's go to our panel first. Uh, Reese, you up first. Um, Linda, Tamika, thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I've witnessed some of the vitriol directed both your ways, um, particularly, you know, on Twitter and the social media. And I know how difficult it is. Um, so I just really wanted to just, you know, thank you for all the work that you're doing and just hope that you continue to stay, you know, with it. And then the other comment I want to make is just on the disinformation part and just how inauthentic it is that, and, and people get so reeled in because it has an emotional and it's provocative and they just get so tethered to these really, really negative views and Tamika, as you said, it's it's that much more hurtful when it's coming from Black people. And what I found frustrating is, like, a, an anonymous person, a white person can say whatever they want about a Black person. And if me as a Black woman comes along and tries to debunk that disinformation, then the daggers come out. They don't want to believe I have to show them all kind of receipts and screenshots and, and, and every kind of document under the sun, but they believe a meme or, you know, a, a picture or whatever with no question. So um, I don't really have a question so much as just to say, like, keep it up, keep up the good fight or not retire and live your life and do whatever you want to do. Be fabulous. That's fine, too. But we appreciate you. And, and that's really all I have to say. Uh, on that point, which you didn't have a question, but I'll go ahead and ask a question. Linda, I'll start with you and go to Tamika. That last point there, this is one of the reasons why people leave. This is, I mean, people are driven out of movements. It, I don't think the average person understands what it takes to stay in the fight year after year after year, knowing full well the assault and the vicious, vicious, viciousness will be coming your way. Y'all could have easily stepped out and said, hey, let somebody else have this, but you didn't, Linda. I mean, I'll just say this, Roland, you know, I'm multilingual. Um, I'm an educated person. I could have done a lot of other different things in my life. I didn't wake up one morning as a kid and be like, when I grow up, I want to be an activist on the front line that's going to get attacked for speaking truth to power. I, I was forced into this work. I think Tamika and I and Carmen, we come to this movement because we are forced to be here. We have been chosen to be here. I came to defend Muslim Americans in the aftermath of 9-11. I came here to defend my people. And then I found more people and they're my people now. And people like me and Tamika, like, you know, we could retire, but where are we gonna go? Um, you know, we are so, we are not neck deep. We are beyond our head deep in the work right now. and. You know, people like us that have went up against powerful forces, like we're not just going to go get, you know, a nine to five job. No one's just going to hire us to do nine to five job. We're still young. You know, we're in our early 40s. Like we still have a whole life ahead of us. And for me, my mission isn't complete and I'm going to be out here, but it takes a lot. It takes mental health. Me personally, I'm a, I'm a woman of God. I'm a woman of faith. And that really has been kind of my driving force of why I'm still here. Listen, if God wants me to take me, God's going to take me. It won't be the opposition. Even if I get assassinated, it's not the opposition that took me. It's that God decided for me to go that way. And that's what I tell myself every day. So I'm going to be out here. I'm going to be on the front lines. I'm going to continue to organize and build movement and defend black people and defend marginalized people in America because we have to. Somebody has to do it, Roland. And I'm not going to allow the opposition to silence us nor intimidate us. And even through the darkest moments of our lives in the last few years, guess what? We were still outside and we still organized against Brett Kavanaugh's hearings. We were still organizing around family separation. That was during the height of the disinformation campaign and we were still outside. Tamika? What else can I say? She said it all. <laughs> all right, let's go. Uh, Nola, you're next. Um, so first of all, I'm just in awe of sharing space with you both. Um, I just recall making my signs with my friends all ready to go downtown Los Angeles um, and make sure that we were out there marching and making sure that our voices were heard. And so to be sharing this space with you two right now is truly, um, it, it, it definitely means a lot to me. And so my, my question is going to come in the form of... Um, through my national security lens and listening to your stories and to think about my work around disinformation and misinformation and for people to really understand how serious this is. Um, I'm thinking about what happened to you both in terms of the relationship between misinformation and disinformation and human security. Human security is one of those um, things that are really kind of um, 
people are starting to take very seriously within a national security space because of everything that you just said and the way that Russian misinformation and disinformation is designed to be insidious, the way that it is designed to tear you down and not caring anything about consequences. I mean, who is just this abstract Russian troll form and um, St. Petersburg that, you know, we, we don't have access to. So, you know, the way that I need people to understand that the, the amount of information that these troll forms have on Americans and they understand what our vulnerable points are. They understand how racism works in this country. They understand how um, gender discrimination works in this country, how sexism works in this country. So when you have a movement, a movement driven by women of color, a woman out there wearing a hijab, it they go back to, you know, all of their information about how to tear us apart. And unfortunately, you all are living examples of how effective Russian disinformation and um, misinformation is. And I am so sorry for everything that you all had to go through and that you're still going through and that you will literally be in the history books as examples of this. And you are living, breathing people. And I'm happy to see that you're still here. Um, but you're making the point for a lot of people like me who talk about the human, um, the human aspect of security, right? Not just, you know, about nuclear weapons and um, all these things that, yes, we should be worried about, but when we're talking about security vulnerabilities about people's real lives, real lives. That's right. Right. And I, think, um, and I that, think that becomes something completely different. Yeah. Um, but just real quick, my question is, what's, what's next? Um, how are you thinking about the movement? Um, what does this article do? You mentioned the word vindication. Is that enough for people to say, you know what? I was wrong about those two. Um, I was wrong about the movement. Does this give you a new momentum? And thank you so much. No, thank you. And I appreciate you and your expertise. And I think this is an important question and frame that you brought up. You know, I want the United States government to understand how vulnerable our democracy is. I want them to understand national security, not just from the perspective of terrorism and counting, countering terrorism, but also countering these disinformation campaigns whose entire mission it is, is to undermine our democracy, is to sow discord amongst the American people. And they have succeeded and showed us that they can succeed. This time it may be Russia. Next time it may be another foreign government that also has a nemesis with the United States. And this is also an opportunity for social media platforms, right? Social media platforms have for so long failed at moderating the conversations and the internet. Who is using social media platforms to be to imposter black women and to imposter LGBTQIA people and other marginalized people? What what is the role and responsibility of social media platforms to keep their users safe? And that is what they fail to do. And the disinformation campaign, what it does is it feeds into people's already existing fears, existing, uh, you know, uh, uh, biases. And what it does is it fuels oftentimes people who may even suffer from mental illnesses. So next thing you know, you, a guy is tweeting at you saying that, you know, you and your daughters deserve to get raped. The next thing you know, you go to an event and you have 40 men standing outside with guns in places like Arizona. So this also goes out back into the street. This is not, I could just delete Twitter off my phone if I wanted to. I could just not be on social media. But that doesn't take away from people looking for us and finding us wherever we were to the point where we stopped even posting flyers saying where we're going to be because it was not safe for us. And so for us, I mean, the momentum of the movement is being stifled right now. It's being stifled by the critiques of Black-led organizations, Black-led movements, people of color-led movements. Um, we are also um, you know, in a moment where a lot of our people feel disenfranchised and they feel disenchanted with politics and the ways in which you know, we've experienced the last few years. And I don't mean experienced as in this story in the New York Times. I'm saying people who are not getting uh, the basic, you know, feed their families. And people are just like, what is what is this election going to do for me? What are these elected officials? So we are in an uphill battle as organizers, encouraging people to vote in the midterm elections. We have 2024 right around the corner and everybody keeps telling us what's going to change. I've been living like this for the last 30 years. What's the thing that you think you're going to give me that's going to change my life? So I'm worried about the state of our movement. And like I said earlier, we're worried, we're concerned, but we know where the right leader is. We know how to talk to the people. We know where the people that need to be talked to are at, and we're willing to go there. Yeah, you know, I agree. And and what I would say is, it's not that they can find you. They did find us. A oh, yeah. number of 
events that we attended, places where we were speaking, and other personal activities that we were involved in, people showed up with guns. And they made, you know, they, they made a ruckus within some of our speaking engagements. It happened to Linda several times. And it also happened to me being followed, having law enforcement, local law enforcement find out, you know, through their different channels that there may be some issue, some threat. And so the police would be present at events or contact some of the schools that I was speaking at, especially during this, you know, really critical time. Again, 2019, uh, they would show up and you have law enforcement officers there saying, hey, you know, we've got a message that you know, someone showing up to the school today that's threatening Tamika's life. And now now I'm threatened two ways because I'm looking at law enforcement standing in front of me who I also am very nervous and challenged by what their role can be. But I have to trust in this moment that they're going to work with the security firm or, you know, the security that I have with me to protect my life. This is happening to us as women also on the road. Um, and, you know, security is also... It's not cheap. So let's just be clear on a very basic level. I go places sometimes by myself now and people say, why are you here alone? You need to have 24 hour security. Well, we did have 24 hour security while we lived in Kentucky for four months fighting for Breonna Taylor. And if I show you the security bill and these were people who are our friends, they are family to us. Mm -hmm. the us. But it's for someone to leave their family and stay with you for 24 hours a day driving the car. We could not go to a restaurant and eat food, just order from people who are in the back in the kitchen cooking. And we don't know that they're looking out into the restaurant. They see us there. We don't know what they might do to our food. Right. Because we know that one of the ways that they've been able to hurt and harm our leaders has been through food. And so we had a, many layers of issues to your point, Roland, that people do not see or even understand. Having to hire someone to come in to make sure that we ate every day. Because by the way, when we were in Kentucky, we were on the news Every single day, there was nowhere that we went in Kentucky that people were not aware. Those are the troublemakers. So how do we know who's the chef in the back that's cooking up our food and putting whatever God knows what in it? And so when people start questioning, why do you need to raise money? You know, what is the money going to? Well, how come you guys have a chef? It's not just vanity. This is necessity for our lives. And it costs a lot of human capital. It, it takes a lot of resources to be able to protect those people who are out there putting their lives out, you know, putting ourselves on the front line and putting our real names, our real pro profiles on the internet. And I, I'll say this last thing that, you know, if there is a younger leader or someone listening right now who's trying to figure out what do I do because sometimes they're being attacked. Do not engage. I, I learned that hard. I learned that because, you know, Roland and others pulled my coattail. Linda took Twitter completely off my phone. I remember waking up one day and there were 400 unique mentions about me in articles on the Internet saying that I was finished. You know, my career was over. They were calling me all types of names, reverse racism, I and mean, you name it. They were all over me on one day. And I sat in, in a dark room so depressed because how do you get out of that? We don't even have the tools to Linda's point about being concerned about, you know, what we are doing in this country and how we're going to protect and defend our democracy, whatever little bit we have left. We don't even have the tools necessary to fight back against people who have been working to uh, undermine the, our movements and our society for far too long. And we better get ready because it's only going to get worse. Great car. That's right. Thank you, Roland. And thank you both, uh, Tamika and Linda. Um, you didn't mention any names, Tamika, but I can say that uh, I talked to F Ferris Stockman at the New York Times for about an hour about ADOS. And when it was clear that she couldn't get me to say what she wanted to say, when she ran the really underwhelming article was really so full of misrepresentations, I wouldn't even quote it. So when I read that Christmas Eve Eve article, accusing y'all of anti-Semitism of Ferris Stockman's name just reminded me that there's been 
to be charitable, let's just say a, a quality drop off at the New York Times. But at any rate, uh, and, they, and they love patting themselves on the back for doing things they should have never done in the first place. But my question is really about the victories that you all have had. And I, and I think about those in this very specific mm -hmm. uh, two, two instances. Um, I've got students at Howard, and I meet students all the time. Some of those students were in the streets with y'all in Louisville. Some of them are Louisville residents. Uh, you all are heroes to them. And I know that sustains you. And I think about the fact that so many people, millions in this country, many of whom would call themselves hating your guts, have material benefits because um, Ossoff and Warnock are in the Senate instead of two Republicans in Georgia because of the work that you all and others did in that battle, that war here in the state of Georgia. I wonder if you could share with us what, you know, maybe an example of two of moments beyond these cameras, beyond this print, beyond this weaponized propaganda and the and the lowbrow journalistic standards that have kind of amplified this stuff, some of the stuff beyond the cameras that have kept you inspired and encouraged. Linda, can I just jump in really quick? Because I want, because, you know, Linda is a great orator, and I would love for her to just run down all the things that we've done and, and the accomplishments. But I just want to tell this one very quick story. You talked about Warnock and also, Well, Lucia Macbeth, Congresswoman Lucia Macbeth, she was standing on the stage with me in 2017 when we brought out all the mothers who lost their loved ones to different forms of violence. She and I were standing on the stage and we looked out at the sea of women. And she said, I think I'm going to run for office. That was in 2017. Look at her now. She is a congresswoman. And that happened because she decided that there was a, there was a market for her, that there were people who would support her. And the women got behind her and supported her in her campaign. And this, this woman, who was known for being the mother of Jordan Davis, became now a congresswoman who was able to uh, use the fire that she has in her belly from the story of her son being murdered by a white supremacist to go out into this country and try to make real change. Those are tangible things that happen with the Women's March that we can tell you, and there's so much more. Yes, thank you. Linda? And, you know, I, I think that's just an illust one illustration of really the larger mission that we have. We were a political force. Um, more women went to Congress in 2018 than ever before. Not only did women go to Congress, um, over 110 women, we had a history making. Two first Latinas from Texas, the first black woman from Massachusetts, the first two Muslim ever in our history, the first two Native American women, the first Palestinian American woman, the youngest black woman to ever. I could go on and on about the history making that we did around organizing women and the women's vote. And back to our origins of criminal justice reform, banning no-knock warrants with a coalition of people in Louisville, Kentucky, keeping Breonna Taylor's name alive and making sure that she trended from one corner of the world to the other, and making sure that somebody, and we're still on this journey, gets held accountable for the murder of Breonna Taylor. We are, our accomplishments of passing landmark legislation across the country, including here in New York City, being part of coalitions to pass the Community Safety Act and, and, and getting an inspector general for the New York Police Department um, that was independent. I mean, we could sit here for days, and that was the thing that really was the most troubling for us, Greg, to your point and your question that you pointed to us, is that we are a woman of not just good organizers. We were winning. We were winning on multiple levels. And the reason we even got to the Women's March was because we didn't win to win and to organize and to mobilize. None of the white ladies we organized with, they never organized. They couldn't organize their own family. And, he, and, and they told us that. They said, we came here because my father voted for Trump, my uncle, my husband. I came here to rebel with you, but I need to follow what you're doing because I never organized the march ever in my life. I was the senior fundraiser for the Women's March. Tamika led all of operations. Janae Ingram, who's a black woman, led logistics in Washington, D.C. We had black women and women of color in all strategic positions around Paola, who's Latina, she helped lead program with Carmen. We need people to know that when you follow women of color, when you center women of color leadership, you will win. And then when you do win, opposition will try to tear that leadership down. Next. Indeed. Well, uh, first off, um, the reality is with all the hell y'all caught, uh, both of you are still standing, uh, still here, still giving folks hell, uh, have endured a lot. 
uh, but the reality is uh, you fought through it. Uh, and yeah, there were folks who didn't abandon y'all, who still took your phone calls. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, and Tamika is right, yeah, there were numerous 2 a.m. phone calls. Uh, but then again, I'm always up late anyway, so you call me at 2 a.m., I'm like, yo, what up? Trust me, it ain't, it, it ain't sleepy. Uh, now you call me at 6 a.m., that's a different conversation. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but look, I, I appreciate both of you. Uh, Y'all do fantastic work. You're doing stuff right now. Again, with Until Freedom, uh, the reality is a lot of folks would have forgotten Breonna Taylor. Uh, were it not without the work that y'all did with the folk, folks on the ground and other people around the country. Uh, and so I say, uh, you know, keep it going, keep the faith. Uh, and of course, uh, y'all know y'all can call me at any time. And like I told y'all then, uh, anytime y'all got something to do, just give a brother a holler. Uh, you, you'll, you'll be on the show. It's not like uh, we have layers here. The only boss I got is Jesus, so ain't nobody above me. So I ain't got to ask nobody. Uh, no, that's right. Thank you, Roland. Your support has been consistent and sustaining because there have been many times, especially with the Breonna Taylor case, uh, that we didn't have anyone to report what was happening after all the cameras left. And, you know, especially after Daniel Cameron uh, did not secure an indictment against those police officers at that point, you know, and I, I say Daniel Cameron is a criminal um, and Ben Crump, attorney Ben Crump has been telling careful how I say what I say about him because, you know, he's such a, uh, he didn't say this, attorney Crump didn't say it, that he's so much of a coward that he could try to sue me for whatever it is, you know, whatever. So with that being said, the cameras left after the Daniel Cameron piece. And then the only support we had to tell the story and to keep it alive was to continue to return to your show so that you can help us to amplify our work. So you're consistent and we appreciate you and we support you, we for you, and we just thank you so much for the love. I certainly appreciate it. So uh, y'all keep swinging uh, and we'll be right there. Uh, Cause again, as MLK said in his book, uh, where do we go from here? Chaos or community. He said, there are four institutions primed to position black people one of the liberate black people. He said one of them was a Negro press, but this is what he said. They must maintain their militancy and not fall for the conservative. Uh, and mm. that's what he wrote because he understood by having a strong black owned media, then we have an outlet to be able to tell our story and fight uh, misinformation, disinformation. Uh, so I appreciate both of you uh, sharing uh, your story with us. Uh, it wasn't easy, uh, but we certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks, back to that Roland Martin Unfiltered video in just one moment. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm a real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?